Good evening. Uh, good morning, everyone. God bless your hearts. This is Brother Smith from First Gospel Church in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, once again, here we are on Saturday morning, still endeavoring to deal with this coronavirus uh, mitigation that our government officials have asked us to honor. Anyway, uh, it's uh, it's good to to at least uh, talk to you again. I'm hoping that this is um, soon to be over with. I'm I'm thinking possibly within a week or two we may be able to go back to having services. I will tell the people at First Gospel Church, the saints there, that uh, if we do start back soon. We uh, we will uh, take some precautions. We'll ask the people not to shake hands or hug each other. Families that uh, come in together, we'll ask you to, uh, you can sit at the same pew, but those who are not with their family members or people that they haven't been with, we'll ask uh, probably just two people to a pew, one on each end. We'll spread the band out where there'll be six inch spacing as well as the ministry on the platform. When we when we come back together, I'm hoping that possibly they'll let us, I'd like to uh, be able to come back together, I'm hoping maybe next weekend. But I know I mentioned that we may, um, you know, have a service with some songs and maybe some, a uh, few people at the church maybe starting this week, but since they started talking about the possibility of us coming back together soon, I thought, well, let's let's wait this week and see what happens, and then we'll look at it next week. We will, again, have uh, Thursday night at, at uh, 7 o'clock Bible study uh, this coming week. So anyway, it's just glad to, I mean, I'm just glad to, to be with you all, as far as I know, uh, everyone that I've talked to seems to be doing okay. God's blessed us. Um, most all of our people are working and doing good. And so I'm just grateful for that. I'm thankful to the Lord that his hand's been upon us and uh, he's watched over us and we're, th we're uh, blessed to be in, in a state like Arkansas where our uh, implications are not implications, but the situations uh, of coronavirus has been much smaller than a lot of states. We're way down on the line. And so anyway, God bless you. It's good to be here today. Uh, I thought maybe uh, today I would talk to you a little bit about the coming of the Lord. I've been working on Thursday nights about... Uh, uh, you know, the, the things that has to transpire where we're at basically in God's timetable and the sequence of events that will take place before the end of the Gentile world. Of course, we still have a lot of things, prophetical things that has to take place yet. Um, I do want to welcome those that uh, from the Dominican Republic that are listening in. Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry for those that cannot understand English, that we don't have an interpreter right at this time. We are working on that. I'm asking the people to continue to pray for Josecito Calderon uh, in Saint, Mar Saint Martin and his wife, Denise, their daughter. Uh, they are, uh, you know, they're shut in right now. You can't go into the country, from what I understand, and you can't come out of it but they're ready to come to Little Rock. They're uh, from, they're, that's Brother Calderon in the Dominican Republic's son and his wife. And um, his wife is uh, a daughter. Uh, her, her, her father is a French uh, citizen. And so she was born a citizen of France. And so, uh, but, and then Saint Martin is, it's a small island. It's half, uh, half of it is French 
under French government, half of it's under Dutch government. And there on the French side there, there is a, a Haitian church there that they've been going to and being a part of for a long time. Uh, I've been there with Brother Leniger before, and Brother Sister Leniger, me and my wife were there. Anyway, uh, but they were under Brother Elias Ciprian's uh, ministry in his church for some time before they moved there. And, uh, but they're, they're, uh, they're willing to come to Little Rock and, and um, they will be a great help to us, our precious family and uh, Brother Josecito's very talented uh, uh, in so many ways, not only as an elder, but in musically talented. He's a great drummer and, and singer and just a, a big help. They're just a, a really nice family. Anyway, all of the people in the Dominican Republic, God bless your hearts. Uh, uh, it's good to talk to you today, and we're working on a way of being able to talk to you with, with interpretation in Spanish. As soon as we can get that set up, we will. Anyway, uh, I just, again, I wanted to say something to you about the coming of the Lord. Um, the, uh, the, the, actually, the coming of the Lord is an interesting topic. And the reason it is, is because the religious world, and always when I'm talking about the religious world, I'm talking about Christianity, uh, the, the religious world of Christianity. There's so many different organizations, there's so many different facets, or secular groups of Christianity that believe so many different things. Uh, you know, I think you could say that all of Christianity teach and believe in the coming of the Lord. Just how is he going to come? When is he going to come? What is it going to, what's going to transpire? How's that going to work? Um, the, uh, let, let me read a scripture to you and in, in, uh, let's turn to uh, Thessalonians. I, I, uh, Uh, I think this would go along with uh, some of the things that's got to transpire, <laughs> of course, before the end of the, the Gentile world because the Lord is coming. But I'm going to say to you that he is not coming the way most people think that he's going to come. Our pattern of understanding the coming of the Lord is from the New Testament, the New Testament writings and the New Testament church. And of course, we also have some prophet prophetical scripture in the Old Testament that helps us to understand it. Uh, one of the things I want you to understand is that the coming of the Lord is not something that's hidden. It's not, he is not coming as a thief in the night. Uh, as has been said so many times in Christianity. So if you'll turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 5, I'd like to read Paul's writing to the church in Thessalonica and what he had to say to them about uh, the coming of the Lord. If you would, we'll start in the first verse. Uh, if you don't have your Bibles, well, I'd suggest getting them because I'm going to try to make a little bit plainer uh, the coming of the Lord uh, and understanding it than uh, maybe that I have sometime in the past I think most of the people in our church understand my position on it. I don't just think it's my position. I think it's clearly scriptural. And so, but some of it, uh, for those of you that are listening in with us, some of it may be a little bit, uh, may be interesting to some, and it may be even a shock to others. But I will say this to you, if you're hearing something you haven't heard before and it seems to be uh, not fit in your puzzle of understanding the word of God, well, just put it on the shelf and don't throw it away because, uh, and then listen with an open heart because I'm going to use scripture that's pretty plain. So if you go with me here in the fifth chapter, First Thessalonians, Paul wrote this. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, and uh, you have no need that I write unto you. 
for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night, and when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. And what he's saying here in this third verse, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as, a, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Of course, when a woman uh, is in childbearing, she never knows when she's gonna go into labor. And so it just happens to her, you know, and, and she doesn't know, uh, you know, when it's gonna happen, but when it happens, it happens, and it, it, uh, it can be a surprise. And it's the same way with the coming of the Lord He's, he's just saying there are people in Christianity that are going to say peace and safety and sudden destruction is going to come upon them. In other words, they're going to think, oh, everything, something's going to deceive them. I'll explain to you what it is as we go on, but something is going to deceive them and causing them to believe that everything's all right. We've got, now we've got peace and we've got safety. And that is when sudden destruction is going to come upon some people. Now he's not talking about the people of God that are in the body of Christ under a knowledgeable ministry that has answers through the truth of the word of God. Because he goes on and says, but ye, talking to the Thessalonians, and he's talking, by the way, 2,000 years ago to a church that existed then. This is not talking to you and I. He's, it's talking to people 2,000 years ago. However, it certainly applies to us because it's talking about the coming of the Lord in the end of the Gentile world. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. So he is coming as a thief in the night, but he is not coming as a thief in the night to the people of God that are under a ministry that knows the truth of the word of God. They're children of the day. In other words, they're gonna see and understand at night and darkness, you can't see where you're going unless you have light. Um, you know, but uh, even though it'll, the world will be a fairly dark world when Jesus returns, because of corruption and evil. But to the children of, of God in the body of Christ, under a true ministry, they're called the children of the day. They will see, it's like day. They have understanding, they've got light. They're not in darkness, not knowing what God's going to do. Let's read a little further. Uh, you are all, verse five, you are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, and for and the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. Notice in verse 10, he said, whether we wake or sleep, in other words, if you die, he's talking to that church back there. If you die, you'll, you'll resurrect. If you're just, you'll resurrect, you know, uh, or if you sleep. If, if, if you die, or rather you die or, re or, or resurrect, you're going to live together with him. If, you're, if you'll stay faithful to God, uh, 
If you die, you'll wake. You'll wake in the resurrection. You'll get a resurrection in the resurrection of the just. And so <clears throat> he's just explaining in this chapter that the children of Israel, uh, the children of God, I'm talking about spiritual Israel, that's the church, the body of Christ. Um, and so, um, uh, we're going to know when the Lord is coming. We're not going. He's not going to come as a thief. And some of what I'm telling you right now today is to explain to you uh, and give you understanding, daylight, or understanding, so that you know something about the the coming of the Lord. You ought to be uh, thankful that you have you have some knowledge about his coming and that it's not going to overtake you as a thief. If you'll be faithful to God and follow after him, you'll know that. Now, now let's let's turn to the second chapter um, of Thessalonians when he writes them their second letter that he sends to them. And there's there's evidently been confusion about the coming of the Lord. Uh, and I can see that because he was in Thessalonica a fairly short period of time. And, uh, you know, he had to flee out of the town because of the Judaizers, the, the Jews were after him. Uh, he went into to Berea uh, and, and then from there he went to Athens. But he did send Timothy uh, to help establish the work there. And um, so uh, he, he wrote these letters back to help them, and evidently there was questions. I'm sure, I don't know where, where the, how the questions came to him. I know Timothy, if they'd have been to him, he could have answered them. But and it, it could have been that he just wanted Paul, since Paul uh, started the work, that he wanted them to give him the answer how he wanted to put it. Um, anyway, in the second letter of Thessalonians, uh, Thessalonians, in the first verse, it says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, notice what he's saying here to them. He's saying, I'm going to talk to you about the coming of the Lord. I don't want you to be shaken in your mind or troubled or, or uh, by a word or even as a letter from me. Thinking that what, you know, if someone is saying or if even if you're thinking that God is saying, uh, the Lord is coming soon. For that day, he's saying, is not, it's, he is not coming until there is a falling away first. And the, sin, the man of sin uh, be revealed who goeth into perdition or the son of perdition. So <clears throat> he's explaining to them that uh, I don't want you to get to thinking that the Lord's fixing to come. It's not, he's not fixing to come. There is a falling away that's going to take place first. Now, I came up in Pentecostal religion before I found the body of Christ, and I was taught that that falling away takes place down here. It's, that's not accurate. He's talking to a church 2,000 years ago telling them that the church is going to fall away. And it has. It did fall away. That New Testament church 
fell away, and we'll we'll get into that. We'll say a little bit about it. I, I hope that I can go slow enough, but yet cover enough uh, material that will help you to understand the coming of the Lord a little bit better. Um, now, let, let's go to, to the book of James and the first chapter, because this is, in my opinion, very important for you to understand because the Bible almost looks like it contradicts itself, but it certainly doesn't. Um, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, and, and these men are both talking about the coming of the Lord, but what you need to understand about Paul, he was the apostle to the Gentiles talking to a Gentile church. James is... He pastored the Jerusalem church. This is not the apostle James, but the Lord's brother. He, he pastored the church in Jerusalem. He's the one that gave the answer concerning uh, Paul's question. I'm trying to, excuse me a minute, but I'm trying to keep from touching my face. I'll just, I'll just share this uh, piece of information that I, I've, I've read about and heard from some of these coronavirus medical professionals that have dealt with it, uh, I read where one said, if you will wash your hands every time you come in contact with something that's not in your, in your uh, immediate environment, every time you go to the store, every time you get out of your car and come home, wash your hands while you're gone don't don't in fact don't touch your face is what this one professional said he said i here's what i can tell you i've dealt and worked with with those in coronavirus now for some time he said i, I and here's what he said i'm not supporting altogether what he said but it made sense he said, if you will wash your hands often and for sure every time you come in contact with something that is, that's not in your immediate environment and not touch your face, he said, you will not get coronavirus. And then he said, wear a mask when you're, especially when you go out. He said, one, number one, a mask will teach you, it'll help you not to touch your face. It won't keep you from getting it. Therefore, you ought to stay within a six foot distance away from others right now. But it will, if you're asymptomatic, if you were to happen to be positive, have uh, coronavirus without symptoms and didn't know it, it will prevent you from giving it to others. So the mask, especially when you go out, <coughs> is is, is a, a uh, I think it's a good thing to do. Then to learn, wash your hands. Uh, remember when you touch your car door, uh, when you touch your steering wheel, you ought to have a, probably a Clorox wipe or something to clean that steering wheel off, clean the door handle, clean your armrest. Uh, just do some, some things like that. It's good preventative anyway. That's just a little side a thought there that I thought I would mention. Now, going back to the coming of the Lord, and, and I want to say this to you. Jesus is coming. I want you to understand how he's coming. Again, I was, I was raised in, in uh, Pentecostal uh, churches from a child up until I found this body of people. And... Uh, when I came here, I found that they had far more uh, knowledge and understanding and, you know, that they their calling was to restore the church from its falling away. Now, here in the first chapter of James, the reason I want to read, I just want to read the first verse because I want you to see that James is not talking to Gentiles. He's talking to Jews. It says, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. So uh, here 
This letter, James is writing, he's talking, to, he's talking to Jews, he's not talking to Gentiles. And if you'll turn with me now to the fifth chapter. Um, and then in the seventh verse, James says, be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. I want you to listen to me about the early and latter rain that I'm gonna explain in just a little while. But look what he's saying. The husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Now here in this verse we're reading, where one man, James, is saying the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, and he's talking to people 2,000 years ago. Then we go over to the book of Thessalonica where Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, is talking to the Gentiles and he said, don't let anybody tell you that the Lord's fixing to come because there's going to be a falling away first. Now, both these men were right. You just have to understand the coming of the Lord in the end of the Jewish world and the coming of the Lord in the end of the Gentile world. Paul was explaining to Gentiles how the Lord was going to come to the Gentiles in his final coming. James was explaining it to the Gentiles and they were already in the coming of the Lord. Um, so turn with me to Joel. Let's turn to Joel, prophet Joel, little prophet, one of the small prophets in the Bible in the second chapter. Now before... <clears throat> Before I go there, let me just say this about the coming of the Lord back there. Jesus left on the, he left on the, he, he, he came on the day of Pentecost, a literal coming in the birth of the baby, Jesus Christ. But he, he came uh, with the forerunner of John the Baptist. His ministry started at his age of 30 years old for three and a half years. He accomplished what God sent him to do and his took him 30 years to get ready for it. it. Took him three and a half years to finish the work that God gave him in his ministry those three and a half years. He came, that was the coming of the Lord in its beginning. Notice one of the things Jesus said, I believe it's in the 24th chapter of Matthew, when he said, the coming of the Lord is as the lightning is from the east to the west. Well, I, you know, I here again, as a young minister and a young man, you know, trying to understand the, the word of God, I just thought when a bolt of lightning hit, you know, that's how the Lord was going to come, just bam, he was going to come and and uh, that quick. But I now realize that it doesn't, that word lightning, if you look up the Greek word used in the Bible for lightning, it means illuminating. It And it doesn't lighten from the east to the west. It lightens from the sky to the ground vertically. What Jesus was talking about and in, in if you understood it in Grecian language, he was saying the Lord's coming, illuminating with, with illumination from the east to the west. And, and the sun, uh, if we went to the 19th chapter of the book of Psalms, you would see that he's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like the sun, S-O-N, the son of God, it's going to lighten or illuminate the earth from the east to the west. The sun comes up in the east, it goes down in the west. So that was a day, and prophetically, that's called a day of the Lord. 
that day, and I won't go into it today, but that day is a 45-year day. Uh, it, that's how long from Jesus returning on the day of Pentecost uh, until God judged the Jewish world in AD 70. That was a day. It, I, I would just say it lasted uh, beyond AD 70, uh, a half hour until AD 78. So <clears throat> uh, the Lord came back there on the day of Pentecost. He continued coming, harvesting that world until he made up the portion of his bride that could be made up among the Jewish people and the what, what people among the Gentiles that came in that uh, was able uh, to grasp enough to possibly, and I do believe some of them made the bride. But as far as the Gentile world, I mean, here we are now nearly 2,000 years later and we still, there's still the the Lord, the Lord hasn't come yet. He's coming in a restored church and it will be the day of the Lord. Uh, I, I think the Lord is coming right now. Uh, I think we've, prob we've already entered it as far as the coming of the Lord in understanding, see, and, and bringing judgment to at least the first fruits of those that are enter into the coming of the Lord. Uh, the Lord hadn't finished his coming yet. But, um, Jake, okay, somebody asked, where are the Jews who made the bride back then? They are in the bride. They, uh, and I will say, my position on that is, is that they are already in heaven with Christ and the angels and the Father. Uh, they they finished their course. They made the bride. And they are there now, and they will be part of uh, the whole bride that's going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> that group back there. Now look how the Lord came. I mean, if you think the Lord's coming in a rapture just to catch people away like that, I think you're going to be. I, number one, I think I think you're confused. I used to believe that and think that, but I know better today. I understand the coming of the Lord. I know how he came in the early church and I know how he's gonna come down here. And so as far as, you know, him just come and catching away, <clears throat> I think every man, uh, let, let, let's hold our place in Joel 2 and just look right quick at 1 Corinthians 15. Let me, let me read this scripture to you. Um, uh, let's start in the 20th verse, 1 Corinthians 15 and 20. By the way, this broadcast will be, po I'll post it on my website so that it can be, uh, it can be seen again. It'll be posted as a video uh, saved. And then on our website, uh, fgclr.com, that's a website for our church. Brother Painter will post it on there. And I believe he's also posting it on, on uh, YouTube. And I don't know how that works. Uh, you'll have to, maybe you can email him if you need to. It, his email is on, on the website. If you go to 1 Corinthians 15 and 20, it says, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. For he must reign till he have put down, enemy, uh, put all enemies under his feet and the last enemy shall be destroyed is death. So every man is going to be made a part of this, but in his own order. In other words, Jesus could appear right here today 
and that would make you perfect or mature. It would make you ready for eternal life. Jesus comes in your life first in salvation. He comes first uh, in a new birth. It first starts out with repentance and water baptism and a, and a, a new birth, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The nature of God is imparted into your soul and you now have two natures, the Adamic nature or fallen nature of Adam. And then you also have the nature of Christ, a born again nature. <clears throat> and that's God's nature. Paul called it the inner man or the new man. And uh, so uh, you... Uh, you have a new nature after you're born of God and that nature will have to be trained up, matured till Ephesians 4 says that the, this ministry, the early church ministry was given for the perfecting of the saints, the work of the ministry. And he said, till we all come to the knowledge of Christ Jesus, and to the fullness of the stature of the man, Christ Jesus. You and I are to grow and develop until we've overcome and mortified the deeds of the flesh and we've, and we've, we've died out to this Adamic nature and been matured and fully brought forth in our completeness in this new nature that we're born in. And that's a process. And it, some, some people, just like Paul said to the Thessalonians, may die. Uh, that's why he went on in the first chapter, in the fourth verse, where he said, you know, I don't want you to be uh, in ignorance concerning them that sleep, those that die. Uh, but he, he shows that, you know, they will the Lord will bring them with, it. there will be a resurrection in the coming of the Lord down here. If those people died before they finish this process, they will resurrect in the resurrection of the just and have an opportunity to finish their course. That's the purpose of the resurrection. Matthew 27, 52, many of the Old Testament worthies that slept resurrected, and had an opportunity to finish their course if they were just and become a part of the bride. Uh, anyway, so Jesus, he is coming again, but he's coming in your life. He's coming. You should be growing and getting closer and closer to him and developing in his righteousness and in his fullness, finally until you put on the stature of Jesus Christ, not his position as being the head of the body, but his righteousness, the same way he became righteous. He became righteous by coming to this world, becoming a human, and going through a process. The Bible said he was tempted in all points as we are. Read the, the last part of the second chapter and the fourth chapter clearly tells us that Jesus was tempted in all points, even as we are. He had to go through temptation to become a faithful high priest and a mediator that understood and was the example for us of how to be born of the same nature he was born of and how to overcome sin, the, the Adamic nature, and be made complete in him in or in that nature of the new man, inner man, Paul called it, that new nature of God that we're born of when we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Okay, back to Joel. And I know I'm running a little bit over time, so I may not be able to finish this. In fact, what I'll say is, is the early and latter rain. I'm gonna say just a little bit about it, but I'm gonna explain it better uh, probably Thursday night. But here in Joel 2, let me read that to you. We'll start in the, uh, the second chapter. And 
the, the uh, 18th verse. It said, then will the Lord be jealous of his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil and you shall be satisfied therewith and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. Now, now here when he's saying, I'm gonna send you corn and wine and oil, he's really talking about the word of God and the spirit of God. Um, he's talking about the, the, the New Testament church. But uh, let's read a little further. It says, verse 20 says, but I will remove far off from you the Northern army and will deliver him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the East Sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea and his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid ye beast of the, of the field, the pastures of the wilderness do spring for the tree beareth her fruit. The fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. This, this is really spiritual typing of, of these natural, the natural fruit and the natural trees, but, uh, and, and that it's gonna bear fruit. You know, God's children will have to bear fruit of righteousness is what he's talking about. Be glad then, you children, of Zion and rejoice in the Lord your God for he hath given you the former rain moderately and he will come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Now, <clears throat> well, let me read a little bit further because this is talking about the harvest of the early church. And the floor shall be full of wheat and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I'll restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, that's Egypt, the canker worm, that's Assyria, the caterpillar, that's me to Persia, and the palmer worm, which is Greece, my great army, which I sent among you. He was talking about the early church, and I'll prove that in a minute. That overcame what they were devastated by during the time of Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. Uh, they were under Rome, I understand that. Uh, anyway, let's go on. And you shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied. Uh, I, I'm sorry, let me back up. I, I went all the way back to Egypt, but actually starting with Babylon. Uh, the, 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 uh, let's go back to the locusts. That's Babylon, the canker worm, Medo-Persia, caterpillar, Greece, and the palmer worm, Rome. That, those, uh, they, those, uh, uh, is because of the time of Babylon when he prophesied this, that, that he was prophesying and showing that God in the early church was going to uh, overcome. These are the same as the four carpenters in, in Zechariah. Anyway, when he said, and you shall eat in plenty, verse 26, and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dwelt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am in the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. Now, I want you to get this next verse, 28. And it'll come to pass afterward that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions and also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days will I pour out my spirit and I'll show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke, the sun 
He will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord has come. So he's ending it with a wrath of AD 70. And of course, this 28th verse where he said, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. This is what this is what Peter prophesied on the day of Pentecost. He said that. He said, this is that spoken of the prophet Joel. And he quoted it. I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. He begins to show that they had got into place. Now, what did he say in verse 23? He said, be glad then you children of Zion and rejoice in the Lord your God for he hath given you the former rain moderately. The, listen to me, saints. The former rain. You can look it up. Look up. Your, look it up in in um, in your concordance. The former rain means the first or fall rain. The former rain moderately, and he'll cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain. The latter rain is is spring rains. See, their rains is, is different than us. Their rain started in October on the new planting of wheat and barley after a harvest, started a new agricultural year. And so, and then the harvest, the rains came early in the, or late in the fall after the planting of wheat and barley. Uh, it came up, it existed down through the winter and grew some during the warmer days of winter, but never came to harvest. But in spring, in April, uh, the spring range came and, the, and now the sun is closer to the earth. It's a picture of Jesus getting closer. He came close to that early church uh, through Jesus Christ. And so when he came in the latter rain, which was the spring rains, and it said, he would give them that moderately in the both the former and latter rain in the first month. In other words, the first month, the first uh, agricultural month was in October. And their rains was October, November, and December, which was the early rain. And then the first month of their, of their see, uh, Israel had two calendars. They had a spiritual calendar and they had a, which it started in April. You remember the Passover started in April. The spring rains came to, to bring heart to harvest the barley and the wheat. And then that year of harvest started in April and began to bring the harvest of barley, wheat. It brought forth figs. It brought forth grapes as the summer came on. It brought forth the nuts, it brought forth the olives, it went all the way down until the fall, until the harvest was over. There was a celebration and the Feast of Trumpets. And of course, a new year started. There was the atonement made to for get rid and forgive all sins for that year and to celebrate the harvest that God had gave them. That's how Jesus came in the early church. He came Jesus, he came in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The forerunner was John the Baptist. God blessed that. He gave them the, the, the early rain, and then he gave them the latter rain moderately. Remember what J Joel said? I, I'm sorry, James, in the fifth chapter of James, it said he had patience for the law and long suffering, for the precious fruit of the early and latter rain. That was the early church he was talking about. And I would like to say some more to prove that the early church had an early and latter rain as well as the latter rain, the early rain for us started with the apostle Paul. He planted after the judgment was upon the, our, uh, he did it along with the early church, but after AD 70, the Gentile church was planted and the rains fell on that, that uh, planting of the apostle Paul of the word of God, which is a picture of wheat and barley. 
and we went through a winter, our dark ages, or the church falling away and going into a dormant season. And now the latter rains is coming and God is blessing his people. The rest of the world, the rest of the world, remember he's coming as a thief in the, in the night for the rest of the world. And that includes some of the world of Christianity that don't have the truth. But before God's coming is finished, he will restore his church and manifest the truth throughout this United States of America and the remainder of the world that he's calling into this final work to make up his, the remainder of his bride. And he's not coming like that. He's coming as it is, as the sun rises in the east, goes down in the west. He's coming in your life and in mine. If we'll watch, watch therefore, Jesus said. Don't slumber and don't sleep, but get your mind open to God. Pray, knock, and it'll be open to you. Seek and you will find. God loves his people and he wants you to know exactly what he's going to do, when he's going to do it, and how it's going to be accomplished. The Lord is coming. He's coming in your life. He's coming in your order. Some people, their order is far is, is above some of us. They've been serving God longer. He's developing in the Lord longer. If, if he just came in your life, listen, he's coming closer to the church. And before the church, and by the time this church is is restored and established in restoration. What couldn't, it's just like in the winter, what you couldn't bring forth because of the season will be easy to bring forth in the coming of the Lord. And I'm telling you, he's close enough right now and the rains of God has already started and you have every opportunity to develop in God and his righteousness in this new born again spirit, the inner man. God loves you and he will bless you and give you the latter rain moderately. We're looking for the latter rain. The early rain has already fell upon the Gentiles, but the latter rain is falling and it's going to... It's a season of it that's going to bring forth a harvest of God down until the end of the Gentile world. And we'll talk more about that, and I'll give you more scriptures to prove to you that the understanding. I can show you in the Bible with scripture that the early rain is fall rains, and the latter rain is spring rains. And we, this Gentile world, We'll have a season of both. We're entered into the latter reign of the Gentile world, God's reigns on this world that's going to bring a restored church completely, that's going to manifest him fully in the end of this world, and he's giving you and I an opportunity to be a part of it. I apologize for going over a little bit today, but I just feel like this is a very necessary uh, message and I hope that you got it. Feel free to email me. My email is uh, listed there. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them. I'll be more than glad to answer them to the best of my ability. God bless you. Now to the saints in, in uh, the Little Rock Church, thank you again for mailing in your ties and being so faithful to support the church I know you know the bills will just keep going on and you've been so faithful. God bless your hearts. Once again, we have ordered a new awning to be installed in the entrance of our church and it should be up probably by the time we're back in church. I'm looking forward to being together with you all again in a, in a service and pray with me that that will happen and come soon. God bless your hearts. Remember, 
in prayer, Brother Ron McNabb in Keswick, Canada. He's having a real difficult time with his heart. Remember him. Uh, Brother Veely's little granddaughter, Bella, keep remembering her fighting cancer at the year, I believe she's eight years old. Uh, let's see, who all else do we need to remember? Of course, remember all of the, our people, especially those that have issues. Brother Bill Daniels, keep praying for him. Brother Shelby Weaver, Brother Ray and Susan Weaver, Sister Abraham, Sister Alexander, uh, Sister Wilson, Sister, um, Sister Weininger, you know, she has some health issues and, and um, she's getting up in years too, like the rest of us. So let's keep her and remember her in our prayers. Brother Oates, thank you, Sister Ruth. Uh, Brother Oates is fighting cancer. Brother and Sister Oates uh, in Godfrey Assembly. They were here in our church for many years. And so uh, we, we certainly cherish the years we had with them and we wanna hold up Brother Oates in prayer. Um, we miss you too, Brother Weaver. God bless your heart. Uh, Sister Hannah, she's got a blessing she wants to testify of as soon as we get back together, I'm sure. Anyway, God bless you, all of your hearts. I miss you all. Looking forward to be back with you soon. God bless.